Welcome to Capital Baptist Church and welcome to our message for today. In case we haven't met, my name is Steve Reynolds. I'm the lead pastor uh, here at Capital, and today we're continuing our series called Women Who Win. And then we're going to be looking at a Bible woman uh, who maybe you've heard of, maybe you haven't. Her name is actually only mentioned twice uh, in the Bible, but she is a tremendous example when it comes to winning. Her name is Lydia, Lydia. And they were going to look at Lydia, and we're going to learn how that she is an example when it comes to faithfulness and how uh, it teaches us by her life uh, how we too uh, can be uh, faithful. As we think about uh, this area of faithfulness, I want to read a verse from Proverbs uh, 20, uh, verse 6. Proverbs 20, verse 6. Here the Bible says, Most men will proclaim each his own goodness, but who can find a faithful man. Wow, that's an incredible verse. I mean, it says, you know, all of us, we're, you know, we, we, you know, we like to lift up ourselves. We all do that, of course. And, uh, we like to proclaim our own goodness. But the bottom line is, who can really find someone that's faithful? Who can find someone that's really faithful? That's a, that's an important question. And I'll tell you the answer. One person that we can look to is Lydia. Lydia. You see, faithfulness, is, it, it's one of the most important traits that you can have in your life. I mean, to be a faithful person, to be dependable, a person that encourages and has faith. And, it, and it's really hard to maintain that, isn't it? I mean, it's hard, you know, the hardest thing perhaps in life is to be faithful, to, to be faithful. And, uh, and yet it's so important that we, we, we lead a faithful uh, life. And so I think we're going to look at uh, Lydia, and I hope you'll you'll be encouraged, you'll be strengthened, and you'll be helped uh, as we talk about how we can win when it comes to faithfulness and how she shows us uh, three ways uh, to win at faithfulness. But I want to read what's called our key verse, which is Acts 16, verse number 15. Here it says, And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, if you've been faithful, listen, if you have judged me to be faithful, okay, again, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. I mean, here she is. She's a, she's a changed person. She's now a follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, she's just uh, been saved and she's now followed uh, her Lord in, in biblical uh, baptism. And she immediately wants to give back. I mean, that's a true Christian is like that. A true Christian, uh, you know, understands what they've received from the Lord, but then also they want to give back and help the Lord's work. And she wanted to do that. And, uh, and she, uh, said to Paul and the leaders, listen, uh, you know, come to my house and stay. I mean, back then they, you know, they didn't really have like hotels as we think about hotels. Uh, like today, and many times people stayed in other uh, people's homes. And and she's saying to them, "Listen, uh, while you're here, uh, let me put a roof over your head. Okay, let me let me let me let me provide for you." And the Bible says she actually uh, persuaded them. I mean, she was kind of uh, a leader, if you will, and she actually persuaded them uh, to do that. So, what a great example! when it comes to faithfulness. She says to them, if you've judged me to be faithful, I mean, she wanted to be known as a faithful person. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we know very little about Lydia in the Bible. And the reason for that, her name is only mentioned twice uh, in the Bible, and both of these are in the passage we're going to look at uh, today. But the reason I put Lydia on the list is not the amount of Bible content, all right, because that wouldn't be true. I mean, again, she's only mentioned twice. But the reason I put uh, her on there is because she plays a pivotal role in church history in that she was the first convert in Europe. Now, this is important, okay? As Christianity is spreading, and now Paul, they're on what's called the second missionary journey. Now we see uh, Christianity uh, spreading uh, to Europe. And you might recall in Acts 16, 9, how that Paul received what's called the Macedonian vision. And in that vision, God sent him to Macedonia. And there was this woman who God had prepared her heart. And, uh, and her name was Lydia. Her name was Lydia. 
And the Bible tells us you heard the gospel and was saved. Uh, Acts 16, 14 says this. Now, a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. And I love this statement here. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. You see, God was working in her life. And the Bible says, you know, God sent Paul. And, and honestly, one of the reasons God sent Paul uh, there was because God knew there was this woman named Lydia and she was ready to be saved. And uh, again, the testimony is the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. So what a great woman, a woman who was the first convert uh, in Europe. Now, as we think about Lydia, I want to go a little further and talk about what I call her, her resume, her resume. And there's four things I want to highlight about her life. Number one, Lydia was a wealthy business woman. Lydia was a wealthy business woman. And the Bible talks about this in Acts 16, 14a. It says, now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. And notice this, she was a seller of purple. She was a seller of purple. So Lydia is a, is a, is a businesswoman, and she was a dealer uh, specifically in the area of a purple cloth. Now, you got to understand something about uh, purple cloth during that time, all right? And, that, and I just want to read this. Dyes during that time, they were natural, not synthetic, all right? So, so today, I, I'm actually wearing a purple shirt. It's kind of a light purple shirt, all right? I wish I had a dark purple shirt. I would have wore that, but I don't have one. But, uh, you know, this is synthetic, all right? This is synthetic material here. But back in Bible times, during this time, they, they didn't have synthetic things. They, they had actual dyes. And uh, the dye for purple was made from a juice found in a very small quantities in certain shellfish. And listen, it took thousands, thousands of these shellfish to make, listen, just a yard or two of purple cloth, all right? I mean, I'm a big guy, as you can see. No matter how much, how many shellfish it would uh, take to make the shirt I'm wearing uh, today. Therefore, listen, because of how hard it was to do, it was very expensive, very expensive. And it was a statement of status and wealth. So Lydia dealt in a very special industry, okay, uh, you know, making purple cloth. And, uh, and, and, you know, people that could get purple cloth, uh, were wealthy people, okay? It, it wasn't cheap, all right? So she was a wealthy businesswoman. Number two, Lydia was from Thyatira. The Bible says in Acts 16, 14b, from the city of Thyatira. Now, what you gotta understand is, you know, when we meet, uh, Lydia, she's actually in Philippi, all right? And, and there's a big, amount of distance between Thyatira and Philippi. It's about 250 miles, all right? And that's a long ways today, but back in Bible times, that was, boy, that was a really long ways uh, to travel 250 miles. And she had gone from Thyatira, which I believe is kind of like her hub, and I personally believe she's in Philippi to expand uh, her her business. And, and she's most likely moved to Philippi uh, to open up another outlet for her business. You know, she's kind of, you know, building her business and, and opening up perhaps a new shop or, or, or whatever. Okay. I, I believe business is what brought her, uh, to, uh, that place. But she is now in Philippi, but she's originally from Thyatira. Now, just a little side note that's kind of interesting to me is that later in biblical history, the Bible talks about there's a church in Thyatira. This is interesting, all right? It's in Revelation 2.18. It says, Into the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. Now, we could preach a sermon on that one verse there. But the point I'm trying to make to you is, I want to emphasize just this one point, the church in Thyatira. The church in Thyatira. There's a church there. But here's what you got to understand. All right. We have no record, no record of Paul or anyone else establishing a church in Thyatira. And you know, we don't know this for sure. Okay. We do not know this for sure. 
But there is a possibility, all right, that Lydia actually went back to her hometown, actually went back to Thyatira, and God used her to establish this church. Again, we have no biblical evidence of that, but just using some good old common sense, uh, it's very possible that Lydia actually went back and God used her uh, to get that church started there. All right, number three, third thing on her resume. Lydia was a religious Jew, okay? That's her uh, church background, if you will. Uh, she's, a, she's a Jew. And it says in Acts 16, 14, see who worshiped God, who worshiped God. When, when Paul meets Lydia, she's worshiping God. And uh, she was a worshiper of God when Paul uh, met her. And uh, probably a Jew, almost certainly a Jew, uh, she's actually honoring the Sabbath, as we're going to see in, a, in just a couple minutes here as we look at another section here in our sermon today. Uh, and she's there uh, on the Sabbath uh, worshiping God, all right? So Lydia was a religious Jew. And then lastly on her resume, Lydia heard Paul preach the gospel and God opened up her heart to receive it. And again, this is, I guess this is my favorite part of this passage, Acts 16, 14d. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. You see, Paul went there and Paul preached the gospel. He preached the good news of Jesus. And and Lydia heard that and God opened up her heart. God opened up her heart. And you know, it's so important to understand that, you know, when people get saved, God has to open up the heart, you know. Now, God uses us, all right, to, you know, uh, you maybe heard me teach this. It's important to understand. You know, when a person gets saved, there's there's different elements involved. Okay, there's the seed. That's the Bible. All right, all right, the seed. But there's the soul winner. Okay, that's the person that shares the seed. Paul was the soul winner. He shared the seed. But then listen, there's the spirit. There's the spirit, and God has to open up a heart. All right, and all three elements. You know, a lot of times, you know. We argue about these things, you know, about sovereignty and things like that. There's no argument, okay? The answer is all. All three are involved in a person coming to know Jesus. And God opened up her heart, and she was gloriously saved. Praise God. So four things. Lydia was a wealthy businesswoman. Lydia was from Thyatira. Lydia was a religious Jew. And Lydia heard Paul preach the gospel And God opened up her heart to receive it. What a lady. What a lady. Now, the thing we want to focus on about her is faithfulness. She wanted to be known as being faithful. All right. She said, please, okay, if you you judge me to be faithful. She wanted to be faithful. All right. And she was faithful. And today we're going to see four different ways that she was faithful. And again, we're looking at these examples uh, to follow these examples. These are models that God gave us in His Word. And all of us, whether we're a man or whether a woman, it doesn't matter. Every one of us ought to want to be like Lydia. Every one of us ought to want to be faithful. So how was Lydia faithful? Well, number one, uh, she was faithful to God. If, you, if you're going to win at faithfulness, you got to be faithful to God. Be faithful to God. See, first of all, Lydia was faithful to God in salvation. Now let's go a little deeper on her salvation story, all right, and, and kind of give a few more uh, facts than we've already mentioned, all right? And let's read Acts 16, 13, and 14, all right? Let's read both these verses uh, because verse 13 gives us some important information. It says, And on the Sabbath day we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. And a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. So what do we see here? We see that outside of Philippi, at a riverside, there are these women that have come together on the Sabbath to worship God. Now, like I said, these are uh, no doubt about it, Jewish women. And one of the things you got to understand is to form a synagogue it re- in, the, in that time, it required ten male leaders. You had to have ten men who would step up 
and say, okay, we're going to establish uh, this synagogue. And so, uh, you know, bottom line is, at this point in time, you know, just based on what we know about history, uh, more than likely there's not 10 men to form the synagogue. And uh, so these women are still faithful to God, and they want to worship God. They don't have a synagogue, but they do go out to the riverside. And the Bible tells us that there Paul sat down and began to talk with them. Now, this was Paul's, the Bible uses the word custom. Uh, in Acts 17, 2, it says, Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures. And so Paul, as his pattern was, or his custom was, when he would go from place to place, you know, he would go into the synagogue. And, uh, you know, he had, you know, he had come out of that, come out of Judaism, and he was a uh, part of the Sanhedrin. That meant he wasn't just a, a Jewish uh, person. He was a Jewish leader. Okay? He was part of a select group of people. But now he's saved. He's born again. He's come out of Judaism. But he goes back there, and the Bible talks here about how he reasoned with them from the Scriptures. And so the bottom line is he didn't have a synagogue to go into. But I don't know how he knew, how he heard, but he heard these Jewish ladies would gather on the Sabbath down by the riverside, and he went down there to preach the gospel to them. And the Bible says in Romans 1.16, and this is Paul speaking, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. And so praise God, praise God. Paul went down there and he preached the good news. He preached that indeed the Messiah had come, all right? And his name was Jesus, and that Jesus lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for our sin. He was buried, and he rose again uh, to give us eternal uh, life. And praise God, listen, praise God that Lydia was gloriously saved. And this was Paul's pattern everywhere he went. Uh, you know, later on in Acts 16, 17, it talks again about Paul, as he continues in Philippi, and it says there, this girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this is what Paul would do. He would go and he would proclaim the way of salvation, all right? He would proclaim the way of salvation. And praise God, Lydia was faithful to God in salvation. She accepted Jesus as her Savior. But it didn't stop there, you know. The Bible says Lydia was faithful to God in baptism. Baptism, it's so important. You know, the Bible describes baptism like the first step of obedience. I mean, the bottom line is you ought to get baptized as quick as you can after you get saved, all right? The Bible's filled with examples of people that got saved and baptized actually the, the same day, you know, the same day. Uh, so you, you want to get baptized as quick as you can, as quick as you can. And maybe, you know, you got saved a long time ago and still haven't been baptized. Listen, now's the time, all right? Now's the time. Uh, the Bible says in Acts 16, 15a, and when she and her household were baptized. I mean, she got baptized, her family got baptized. Now, why is baptism so important? Well, first of all, you got to understand that baptism doesn't save you. We're not going to get to heaven because of baptism. But don't let you, don't, don't think because I said that it's not, you know, really that important. It is really that important. All right. Because what baptism is, baptism is a symbol of our salvation. It, it, it's a, you know, when you get saved, it's an inner thing. It's a, it, you, you get saved. God opens up your heart and you're saved. Baptism, listen, is a public thing. It's not a private thing. It's a public thing. And it's when you come out and you're willing to say, you know, out loud to others, I am a believer in Jesus. I am a follower of Jesus. And when you get baptized, Romans 6, 4 describes it this way. Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You see, the Bible talks here about baptism. It's a symbol of our salvation. And so when a person gets baptized, they come into a, like a pool of water. And, uh, and when they get baptized, what I do is I say, if you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, 
And they have to say yes, because that's the prerequisite for getting baptized. You can't get baptized unless you're saved. And then I say, based on your profession of faith, and I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Why do, why do I say that? Because Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then I say this, I say, buried in the likeness of his death, and I put the person under the water, and then immediately raise them up and say, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Why do I say that? Am I making this stuff up? Is this just some religious gesture? Everything I do is 100% based on the Bible, based on the Word of God. This is biblical baptism. And it says that baptism, listen, when you're baptized, you're baptized into his death. And then just as Christ was raised from the dead, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. If you've never been obedient in baptism and you'd like to get baptized, email me. We care at capitalbaptist.org. We care at capitalbaptist.org. And, and, and listen, be like Lydia. Be faithful. Be faithful. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I would not want to stand before God, uh, without getting baptized if I could be baptized. I just, I just won't want to do it. It, it you know, I, I, I get it. You know, the commandments are the commandments, but, but if you look at the Bible closely, it, it is the first step of obedience. All right. And if you haven't done it, you need to do it, all right? So first of all, be faithful to God. Be saved, be baptized. Number two, be faithful to the family. Be faithful to your family. You see, Lydia provided a spiritual example to her family. Let me say that again. Lydia provided a spiritual example to her family. Acts 16, 15, a just a little pithy statement. It's easy to miss it, but it says, and when she, 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 she is showing the way. She is showing the way. She is showing the right thing to do, all right? And uh, one of the most important parenting passages in the Bible, uh, maybe the most important, is Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 7a. It says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Okay, that's called the great commandment. But it goes on to say, In these words which I command you today, shall be in your heart, shall be in your heart. And then it says, verse 7, you shall teach them diligently to your children. So, wow, look at this, okay, look at this. I mean, listen, all our life is to be based on the great commandment. I mean, all our parenting should be based on the great commandment because it is the number one commandment, the first and the greatest, according to Jesus. Love God with all your heart. Love God with all your soul. Love God with all your strength. And then as a parent, it says, you're to pass that on, all right? You're to pass that on. But it doesn't skip down to verse 7, you shall teach them diligently to your children. Yes, you should do that. But there's a verse in between that's so important. It says, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart, shall be in your heart. And so listen, parents, listen, grandparents. Our, our love for God, we should love Him with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all right? And then we should want to pour that into our children, but it's got to be in us first. You can't pour out something you don't have in you. So make sure you're loving God and make sure you're pouring it out and, and then listen, teach it diligently to your children. Again, shall be in your heart. Lydia had it in her heart. She loved the Lord, okay? She loved the Lord. And she had it in her heart, and, and she wanted to do everything she could to have her uh, family uh, also be saved and baptized. And so listen, that happened. Lydia led her family to salvation and baptism. Acts 16, 15 says, and her household were baptized. Wow, what a glorious day. I mean, I mean, you know, from what I can see here, it's like a family baptism. Praise the Lord. I've, I've done a few of those, all right? And what a, what a wonderful, wonderful thing, uh, to happen. She loved her family and, and, and she wanted them to be spiritually right with God. You know, the number one thing you should want with your family is to do everything you can to have your family be followers of Jesus and love the Lord. And as parents and grandparents, uh, we should do that. Okay. And then lastly, oh, what a faithful woman we got here. She's faithful to God. 
He's faithful uh, to her family. She's also faithful to church. She's faithful to church. You know, I love the local church. I mean, I, I've literally given my entire adult life to the local church. I, I just love it. It's not perfect, okay? It's full of flaws. It's full of problems. It's, it's, <laughs> it's full of sin, okay? There's pl- plenty of sin in the church, you know? And, uh, and it's, it starts with me. Okay? It starts with me as far as I'm not perfect. I'm flawed. I struggle with sin just like everybody else. All right. But I still love the church. I still love the church. It's God's church. It's a, it's an institution that he uh, created and he's raised us up to lead people in a, gro- a growing, growing relationship with Jesus. And Lydia was faithful when it came to church. Lydia was faithful. Number one to the leaders of the church. To the leaders of the church. Acts 16, 15, C says, She begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house. Come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. You see, I love this statement here, kids. Our key verse. I mean, I mean, she said to them, Listen, come to my house. Come to my house. And, uh, you know, she was, from what we can tell, a successful businesswoman. And she probably had a good-sized house, probably had a reasonably uh, large uh, house. And, and she was a salesperson. She was a leader. It says she persuaded us. I mean, she could go out and she could get people to buy purple cloth, all right? Very expensive product. And she, she had the leadership. She had the charisma. She had what it took to, to sell purple cloth, uh, which I'm sure wasn't easy to do. And she to- told these men, men, listen, you need a place to stay. I, I, I've got, I've got a nice home here. Okay. I'd like for you to come and stay in our home. And she persuaded us. See, she supported her church leaders. You know, she supported her church leaders. And let me tell you something as a church leader. Okay. I appreciate your support. Okay. I appreciate your support. And, and one of the big things that she offered, because the body of Christ is diverse. And we don't all offer the same thing, all right? We're, we, we, all, listen, you have a unique contribution to make, and I do too, all right? But her contribution was hospitality. I mean, she was, she was a woman of hospitality. Uh, it says in 1 Peter 4, 9, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. And, and, and Lydia lived this verse. She was hospitable. She didn't grumble about it. She, she, she actually begged them. I mean, it literally says, she, she, she begged them to come into her home. She wanted to serve and she wanted to help them and meet a basic need in their lives. But also Lydia was faithful to the location of the church. Wow, this goes even a step further. It wasn't just that she was willing to have the leaders come and stay. She was, <laughs> she was willing to have the whole church come and stay. All right. <laughs> and again, at this point in time, you know, Churches met in homes, you know, they didn't have church buildings. That, that came later. And, and church buildings, there's nothing wrong with the church building, okay? <laughs> They're good, all right? But you, you work with what you got, okay? And what they had at that time was, were homes. And again, the bottom line is, more than likely, she had a pretty nice home. So she could swing open her uh, doors and say, church, come and worship here. It says in Acts 1640, so they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. So what happened was Paul and the leaders, they actually got put in prison, all right, for preaching the gospel, put in prison. And when they got out, listen to this, when they got out, you know where they went to? They went straight to Lydia's house. <laughs> they entered the house of Lydia. And you know what was going on there? Worship was going on. Fellowship was going on. Uh, you know, discipleship was going on. Uh, they they he, they went and they saw the brethren. The brethren were meeting there in her house, and they encouraged them. And then they departed. You see, more than likely, Lydia's home became a church in her house, a church in her house. And this is not unfamiliar to the New Testament. There's at least four other examples: uh, Romans sixteen three through five, First Corinthians sixteen nineteen, Colossians four fifteen, and Philemon one two. Again, physical church buildings came later on and thank God for them, but also thank God for homes, okay, where we can minister and where we can, we, where we can serve. And the Bible says in Luke 12, 48, B, for everyone to whom much is given from him, much will be required. 
And let me tell you something. Lydia had been given much. I'm sure there were others there that in their heart they wanted to open up their home, but they didn't have much of a home, okay? It wasn't a place where people could gather. But she had been blessed. She had much. And she took her much and she used it. She, you know, you're, you're, everything you have, you're a steward of it. You're a steward of your home, your car, everything you got, okay? And she gave that to the Lord to use for His glory. Not just for her own personal enjoyment, her own personal benefit. She opened up her home for the church to gather. To whom much is given, much is required. Ladies and gentlemen, do you want to be faithful to the Lord? You know, everybody will proclaim their own goodness, but a faithful person, can you find them? I hope today God finds you to be faithful. Number one, I hope you're faithful to God. If you've been saved and baptized, if you haven't, listen again, email me, we care at capitalbaptist.org. Do that. Be faithful to your family. You know, be, be one who has it in your heart and then you give it to your family. And then also be faithful to church. Be faithful to God's church. Are you winning at faithfulness? I hope so. I pray so. And if not, listen, determine today you're going to be a Lydia and you're going to win at faithfulness.